I'm going to go over real quickly. And then after I finish the review, then I get into the points that I want to deal with this evening. And so I have been teaching on the times that I teach when pastor is not here. I've been teaching on making God's word a priority. And so we have covered parts one and part two. And God's word must be a priority in our lives. And especially in these end times, we're approaching, we're in the end times and we're approaching the end, end times. But you better be equipped in the word of God. And so it's very important that you know what entails in having God's word a priority. And so who we, uh, very quickly, I'll give you the definition that I had for priority. The word priority means precedence. It means especially established by order of importance or urgency. So we must have the idea that God's word must be, must be a priority. It has to be in urgency. That's how the, the apostles, when they minister, they expected Jesus to come back right then. And so what they taught with a spirit of urgency, and this is the same attitude that we must have because we have believers, we have uh, uh, loved ones, and we have coworkers, and we have neighbors that have not accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we don't want any of them to go to hell. And so it's our responsibility to share the gospel, but we must make this word a priority. It shouldn't be the last thing on your list. Many times, it's the last thing, well, okay, if I get to my Bible time or if I pray, you know, I'll do everything else. And when you make God last, usually you're not going to get to it. Been there, done that. You got to make it a priority. And if, you know, and so if we're going to um, just be successful in the things of God, God's word must be a priority. He cannot, he doesn't want, he doesn't want a part-time love. He wants a full-time love. Amen. Uh, uh, I'm dating myself, but little Johnny Taylor used to sing a song. I want a part-time love. No, -uh. it's all, all or none. So he doesn't want a part-time love. He don't want part of you. He wants all of you. So if you look at your handout that you were given, Making God's Word a Priority, that's the title. And the text is coming from Job 23, 12. He says, neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips. I have esteemed the word of God more than my necessary food. So I have esteemed the word of God more than my, nece bar your pen, more than my necess uh, necessary food. Thank you. And uh, so... Job is saying is that I desire God's word more than the food that I eat. And so we must have that same, same attitude. We must desire God's word more than our necessary food. And like I said before, the, uh, no food, no word, no food. So you fast. You can fast the word, fast the food. All right, so I talked about some time ago, point one, through uh, how do you make God's word a, a priority through the study of the word. Second Timothy 2.15, it says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a work with that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word truth, because there's a wrong way to divide it. And so that's why you have to rightly to divide the word. And then Acts 17, 11, it, the Berean Christians, it says that they were more noble than the enemy because they did. They searched the scriptures once a week. Daily. They searched the scriptures daily. And that word daily means they investigated. They examined. They searched. And then John 5, 39, Jesus said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be what? Filled. You want to be filled with the word of God? Then you're going to have to what? You're going to have to seek him first, and you're going to have to search the scriptures. He said, if you hunger, you got to, Father, I hunger and thirst after your, after your word. You may have to declare and decree that. And the more that you declare and decree that you hunger and thirst, 
Guess what's going to happen? You're going to have the hunger and thirst, and guess what he's going to do? He's going to fill you up to overflowing. And then in Psalm 42, 1, it says, As the deer, or heart panted, that means to long for, yearn eagerly after the water brooks, he says, So my soul pants and long for after thee. This is where we deal with things that um, bombard us in the soulless area, in the arena of your mind. You, the word, your soul is where your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotions reside. And so if you don't renew your mind and fill up your mind with the word of God, Satan's going to have havoc with your mind. There are many Christians who are depressed, committing suicide, and you know why? This here, the thought came here. thought of suicide came in a thought form. And then they meditated on it. Depression came in a thought form. Unforgiveness came in a thought form. So it's so important that we renew our mind. He says, as the deer panted for water, long for so my soul. Your soul is longing for God's word. And so we must renew. You need your pen back? You must renew your mind with the word of God. Let's look at Psalm 63. One says, oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek. Early will I seek thee. My soul's thirsty. He's dealing with the soulish area because this is where it entraps us. It's the soulish area. He says, my soul thirsted to have a, the word thirst to have a strong desire, a craving for thee. My flesh longing for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. If you feel like you're in a desert, that's because your soul is not being fed. You feel like you're in a dry land? You feel burning out? You know, people have something burnt out. That's because your soul's area is not being thirst and rejuvenated. Then in Psalm 63, 2, he says, To see thy power and glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Psalm 84, 2, My soul longed, yearns, yea, even fainted to cease to be finished, perish for the course of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cried out for the living God. Psalm 107, 9 says, He satisfied the longing soul. And fill it, the hunger soul, with what? What does he fill you with? Goodness. We serve a good God. Joshua 1, 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate, you shall mutter, you shall speak in it day and night that you may observe to do. You're going to meditate. I put it in red so you can see. You're going to meditate, mutter, day in and day and out. And then, and then when you meditate, then you're going to do something. You're going to observe to do what you meditated on. According to all that is written for you, he didn't say God here, it says for you will make your way what? Prosperous. And then you have good success. You want to be a successful individual, a successful Christian, a successful person. He says that that's your responsibility to make your way prosperous and for you to have good success. Not God's responsibility, it's yours and mine. And how do we make that happen? We make it happen by meditating, muttering, speaking, thinking, declaring the word, and then observe to do according to that we have meditated on. All right, and then it talks about in Matthew, we all familiar with Matthew 6.33. Everybody, let's quote it. Come on. But I'm, I'm going to read it the way people act the scripture out. Seek, seek the things first. And then, all the, and then we'll seek God last. People go around seeking things first rather than seeking God first. No, he says seek him first. He's, we're talking about what? Priority here. Seeking him first. In Deuteronomy, it says they that may learn to fear me all the days. So that's talking about a reverential fear. So if we really be, have a reverential fear for God, we're going to make him a priority. Think about the people that you respect. 
I know I respected my parents highly. They were wonderful parents. And I, I, when I went away to college, you know, I went to a, a college during the, the issues of the 60s. And when I went away to college, I mean, it was a school, you know, where I could have done anything I wanted to do. Because I sure didn't have the word of God back then. But because I revered my parents, there was just a certain line that I was not going to cross out there on my own. You know, no responsibility, free as a bird. But what? Because I revered my parents so much that I go, oh, they wouldn't, they wouldn't appreciate this. They wouldn't want me doing this. Well, how much more should we revere God? Have a reverence for him. And so we have such a reverence for him that we won't miss putting him first, making him our priority. And then he tells us in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6, and thou shalt teach them diligently to our children. And the way you're going to teach them to your children, you're not going to go like we was many times when we were coming up, do as I say, not as I do. That's not going to work with these kids. Our kids are very intelligent. They are observing our behavior. No, we got to live it out before them, and then we can verbally teach it to them. But they got to see your walk first. We have to live out this word before them so that we can, what, verbally instruct them. And then my point, too, was through developing a consistent prayer life. Gosh, we had a wonderful time just uh, 10 minutes ago in intercessory prayer. It was so awesome. And so quickly, I'm just going to go through this. Prayer is, and these are just some statements about prayer. Prayer is asking, it's petitioning, it's requesting, it's beseeching, it's talking, it's communing, it's communicating, it's fellowshipping with and seeking God. It is also receiving. Prayer is a habit. This is something that you do as a habit. Don't leave home without it, as Carl Moss used to say about the American Express card. It's a habit. It's a habit that has to be developed. And so we must have, as believers, we must have a developed prayer life because of the fact that we are called priests. And the, the responsibility of the priest is to intercede on behalf of the others. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, it talks about pray without ceasing, uninterrupted, without omission, that which is constantly occurring. We're to be persistent in our prayer. You, we were being persistent and doing corporate prayer. And then we're to take that, what we were doing in intercessory prayer the earlier, take that uh, and, and during our prayer time at home that we're to intercede. And then we looked at 1 Timothy 2, chapter 1 through 4, Tom will pray for all men. And she gave us some handouts. And we went over these handouts, and this is one of the ones that we were praying for those in the 1041 of the countries. We prayed for the United States of America. We prayed for all the countries over the world. All oh, this is what we were doing. We were interceding. We were standing in the gap. These are all countries that she uh, has given us who come to prayer uh, all the time. And so every almost all these countries are listed here. What's that scripture? I always have to ask you. What's that scripture? Give me the nations that you Come on, Psalm 10. I love it. What is it? But quote it to me real quick. Quote it. Give me the nations. These are nations here. These are people. These are people. So we're to intercede. We're to stand in the gap. We're talking about like uh, uh, the, uh, the pastor, uh, Pastor Saeed Abedini. Just put, when you, when you stand in the gap, when you intercede, what are you doing? You're putting yourself in their stead, in their position, as if you were there. So when I pray for him, I pray as if I'm over there in that horrible prison that he's experiencing. Because I'm standing in the gap. And all those uh, believers in China that are incarcerated in these horrible camps because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So what do we do? We stand in the gap, people. We don't, we're not playing church here. We got to intercede for our brothers and sisters. Always think of what if it were you or some of your loved one. I have a daughter. 
What, you know, and she went to Beijing on, on a trip. Thank God she got back home safely. But being a believer, and say if they had visited, decided to visit a church, an underground church, and then they raided the church. They put them, incarcerate them, put them in a camp. So we have brothers and sisters that don't have it like we have here in America. So we are supposed to be other-centered, the Bible says. That means get our focus off ourselves and stand in the gap for others. So we have, you know, we're going to continue to intercede for our world. And she read some awesome statistics about how in, those, in Iran, which is a very, uh, that's where Pastor Abedini is, but the thousands of people that are coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thousands of people are coming. Uh, one country, they, they counted, what, 17, and how many are there now? There were 17 believers, and how many? 100,000. So God is moving. And you know why he's moving? The saints. Because of intercession. Because of standing in the gap. Standing in the gap. I love those statistics. The how that people are coming. And of course, you know, CNN and ABC are not going to report that. Because you have to get it, you know, from a Christian source. All right. And then uh, Philippians 4, 6, it says, Be anxious for nothing uh, in everything through prayer, supplication, that your requests be known. And then we looked at Daniel, how Daniel, he did what he always did. Even un- in an adverse situation, in a-, in a decree had gone out to tell him he could not petition his God. But you, that didn't stop him. Why? Because he did what he always did. He was a prayer warrior. And then we looked at David. And David, any time he inquired of the Lord, the scriptures are there, I'm not going to go over them. Any time he inquired of the Lord, what happened? God answered. And then the Apostle Paul. And see, we want to believe, believers want to be believers like Apostle Paul. Look what he says. And he says, throughout all of these that I've listed, he says, without ceasing, I make mention of you in my prayers. I'm not going to ask you to show your hand. This is a rhetorical question. Don't answer it. How many of you are praying for your brothers and sisters? He says, I make mention of you. Look at the, you can read it. I don't want to read all of it, but look at how many times he says, all the time, I make mention of you. Don't raise your hand. How many of you are praying for me? Don't raise your hand. I trust everybody sitting in that chair, you're innocent, because I'm a minister here on staff, and pastor, and I hope you're praying for pastor, and I hope you're praying for me, because we need your prayers. And pray for other pastors and leaders. And pray for the leaders here. All of you, all the people here that are in leadership that you see in Manna and that you see as an usher, uh, David and, and Mr. Gilchrist and, and the counselors. How many of you pray for counselors? Don't raise your hand. Counselors need your prayers so that they can minister effectively to the people who come into that, that, uh, that counseling room. Pray for the directors of all the departments. Every health ministry worker, I pray for you. I pray for every director. I pray for every health ministry worker. I pray for the body of Christ. My prayer is that the body of Christ, particularly spiritual, only will walk worthy of him to all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of him, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all long-suffering and patience with joyfulness. I just played the word of God. That's in scripture. I just put a bunch of scriptures together and prayed the word of God over you. So, thank you. (laughs) Well, thank you for praying for me. (laughs) I call those things me not at all. (laughs) Praise the Lord. And so, that, that is my review, and I'm going to get into my third point. The third point that I want to talk about uh, this evening 
is point number three is assembling consistently with other saints. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Hebrews chapter 23. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. I'm sorry. All right, so, <laughs> so in verse 25, it says, forsaken, not forsaken the assembling of yourselves together as a man of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So he's saying here that we are to assemble ourselves, and that word means not avoiding worshiping together as some do. That's one translation. The Message Bible says not avoiding worshiping together as some do. Don't be a drive-by Christian or a fly-by Christian. Be consistent in your walk with the Lord. It's, it's amazing. People want God to answer their prayers immediately. But what time, in, what kind of investment, what, time, what kind of time are you investing and in spending with him? It, it's a, it's, you remember uh, Christianity is a relationship, right? Not a religion. So that means if it's a relationship, you're supposed to have a relationship with what? With someone. With a person. So if it's a relationship, that means you're going to what? Spend some quality time. You know, we hear this word a lot, especially when we're dealing with, you know, relationships with our children. But God wants us to spend some quality time with him. I mean, I don't know no other way to live. How about you? I mean, this is just what you said, that this is the life of Riley. You remember that? It was an old movie. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you guys are so young. <laughs> I said, what is she talking about? <laughs> you know, uh, you know. But at least three people know. <laughs> three people know. Hallelujah to Jesus. Okay, I'm going to I have to come up with some up-to-date uh, <laughs> movie examples. <laughs> but you know what, you, what they put on TV for y'all today, God knows I can't watch it. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. All right. So assembling consistent with other saints. And then let's look at Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Luke. So that's what the word church is. Ecclesia means a call out one. So if we call out, we're to assemble, then that's what we do. We're supposed to assemble together. And in Luke, you know, we always said that Jesus is our example. And he definitely is our example. Well, let's look at this example what Jesus did. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. So he says here in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, he says, and he, I'm reading first from the King James Version. He said, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, now this word custom means a habitual practice of an individual. It's a practice followed as a matter of course among a people. So he says, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. A habit is a customary practice or manner. Now, I like the, uh, the message Bible, what it says here in Luke 4, 16. He says, as he, talking about Jesus, always did on the Sabbath, he went to what? The meeting place. So he, he wasn't there. He didn't come one week and he wasn't there the next week. Or wasn't there coming every other week. Remember that part-time love I was talking about? So, you know, I'm just saying, if you look at the picture, you're treating him as a part-time love. Because the Bible says, he's supposed to be the example. He says, this was his habit. 
This was his custom. I mean, this is something he did consistently. So, you want to lay hands on the sick and cast out them demons, and you're supposed to. You better. But what about coming consistently in a corporate setting? Consistently. And I must commend you. I love the way this room is looking now. You guys notice, for those of us who have been coming a while, keep it up. Let me encourage you. Keep it up. You look good sitting out there listening to the word of God. And you're going to benefit from it. Because we, there, we will suffer persecution. Because we're living godly. But if you don't know what to do with the persecution, then you're going to go the way of the world and respond the way of the world. But see, you know, now because you're coming and learning and, and growing in the things of God, you're going to know how to respond to this persecution. You just might be bold and say, bring it on. Because I got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And like uh, Elisha told his, uh, his servant, he said, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Because there was a whole lot of big army that, that, that the uh, servant was looking at. And he was looking in the natural. And, and Elisha said, Show him in the spirit realm. And then that's when he showed him that, remember the movie, that chariots of fire? <laughs> showed him those chariots of fire. Why? God intervened. Two people, and God intervened on their behalf. All right? So here, Jesus, he did this as a habit. All right, now I'm going to go to my next point. Point four, I want you to allow the gift within you to bless others. Allowing the gift within you to bless others. You have been gifted with certain gifts and talents. And they're not just for you to hoard for yourself. They're for you to bless other, the body of Christ. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. 2 Timothy Chapter 1, verse 6. Let's look at that real quick. In 2 Timothy, we're talking about making God's word a priority. And so we're now looking at allowing the gift within us to bless others. In 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Wherefore... I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. He says, stir up the gift of God. So your gift, it says in, in the book of James, it says every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. So whatever your gifts are, your talents are, guess who gave it to you? Even the people who don't serve him, he still gave them the gift. Because the gifts of God are calling them without repentance. And I, I was listening to a, a young lady in an interview who's a secular uh, singer and, uh, I, you know, I guess she's been singing secular music for a number of years. I don't know how many. But she was saying how she doesn't want to sing anymore. You know, she doesn't have that passion, that fervency. And I'm thinking, maybe because you was in the wrong lane. Maybe because you should have been serving your gift to God. That's why you burn out. That's why you don't have the drive and the passion. Because you're using your gift for somebody else and you didn't give it to God. Use your gifts. He came from him. So use your gifts and talents to glorify him 
And that's how he is glorified is through our gifts. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Real quick, verse 14. It says, here again, he says, neglect not the gift that is in thee. So this word neglect means to be careless of, not to care. So when you don't consider the gift that God has blessed you with important, that's a slap in his face. He says, neglect not. So then this word neglect means to be careless of, not to care about it. Making light of or making light of it, of the gift that he's given you. He said, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by the prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. That's just an order of elders laying on the hands. So God has gifted us with certain gifts and talents that he wants us to be able to bless others. You know, manna, you know, they're a blessing. He's blessing us, you doing this, this, whatever you're doing over there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, the ushers, you know. Uh, and thank God for the Sunday school teachers. Amen. We need more. And those who work with the teenagers, thank God for those teachers. Because they're making, they're being a blessing to others. They're using their gifts and their talents. Okay. So he says here, <clears throat> so don't elect that gift that's in you. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans, real quick, Romans chapter 12. We're talking about making God's word a priority, and we're dealing now, we've talked about forsaking not the assembly of ourselves. Now we're looking at to allow the gift that God has blessed us with to bless others. Starting at verse 4 through 10, and I think I'm going to read it from the Message Bible. There's some stuff I like in here and some stuff I don't, but uh, let me see. Romans. All right, so it says here, if you preach, no. In this way, we're like the various parts of a human body. Listen to what he's saying. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of his body. But as a chopped off finger or a cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we aren't. You don't have to compare yourself with anybody. You are uniquely and wonderfully made. And you don't need to be anybody else but you. God made you to be you. You don't need to be anybody else. If you preach, just preach God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help. Don't take over. <laughs> if you teach, <laughs> stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. Hello. That's, that's not for the body of Christ. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't, get yourself, don't let yourself get irritated with them. <laughs> Hello. You ever worked at <laughs> That can very easily happen. I'm going to read that again. Don't let yourself, when you're working with disadvantaged people, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. 
I love that. That just brought it right home, didn't it? That was in the message. Romans chapter, what did I say, 12? 4 through 10? 4 to 10. Yeah, 4 to, uh, 4 to 10. All right. I'm moving right along. My last point. How many minutes I got before? Okay. All right. So, and my last point, point five, I'm talking about keeping God's word a priority. The other way is through worship and praise. Worship and praise. Now, first I'm going to give you a definition for worship. Worship means great honor and reverence paid to someone regarded as sacred. That's what the word worship means. It means to minister to, and the word minister means to attend to. Let's go to Luke chapter 24, the Gospel of Luke chapter 24. So making God's word a priority, we're going to do it. So you don't, you don't just worship him uh, when, um, when you um, come to church. I was teasing my, my, my daughter and uh, her sister. They are football fans, and of course, my daughter's brother plays for the Seahawks. So they were, oh, they were, you know, it was just two of them in the house, you know, and boy, they were day loud. <laughs> what was I doing? I was in the city, standing in the gap for them, <laughs> to praise and worship. And I, I declared and decreed that they're going to win, and they're going to the Super Bowl. <laughs> it worked. Why they scream and hollering and, 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 and you know and you know calling 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 plays and why don't they do this and why do this? I'm in there interceding for them because uh, when they talked to their father, he you know he was saying they played a lousy game, but they won. Why intercession? <laughs> Standing in the gap, intercession. <laughs> Standing in the gap for them. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, hallelujah. So, in Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 50, yeah. He says, And he led them out as far as to Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, and they what? They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And then let's go to Acts real quick. Well, let me go to John so we can go in order. That will save us some time. John chapter 4. This is Jesus uh, was with the woman at the well, Samaritan here, and um, so they had this dialogue regarding the water and the well and whose well it was and worship. And she said, we worship, you Jews worship somewhere else. And, you know, we worship here on this mountain, da-da-da-da-da. And then in verse, starting at verse 20, he says, it says, our fathers worship, and she's saying this, our fathers uh, worship in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is a place where we ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour coming, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem, what? Worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for, for salvations of the Jews, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the what? True worshipers, true worshipers, shall worship the Father how? And spirit and what? In truth. So it won't be about a place. It's be about worshiping him in spirit and in truth. The Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him how? 
and spirit and in truth. Now let's go to the book of Acts. But we'll just go in order here. Acts chapter 13. Really? Okay. Uh, all right. So write down Acts chapter 13 and 2 and read it on your own. <laughs> write down Philippians 3, 3 and read it on your own. Because I got to uh, give you praise. The next uh, definition I want to give is praise. Uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 2, and John chapter, no, no, yeah, Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, okay? Now, let me get to the other one. We talk about uh, the, we're talking about uh, making God's word a priority through worship and praise. I gave you a definition for praise, and I'm going to give you a definition for, uh, for worship. Now, here's the definition for praise real quick. Words that tell, listen up, go write it down if you wish to, Words that tell the worth or value of a person or thing. Words. So that means we speak words when we give praise. So words that tell the worth or value of a person or thing. Right? Uh, Psalm 8, Psalm chapter 8, verse 2. And then the other scriptures I'll give you, I'm only going to have time to turn to two. So let's go the, to the eighth division of Psalm. The eighth division of Psalm. So in verse one it says, Lord, our Lord, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. He says, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings. Actually, I'm going to read it, finish reading from the Amplified. He says, out of the mouth of babes, and unweaned infants, you have established strength because of your foes that you might silence the enemy and the avenger. Now that word strength can mean force, it means security, it means praise, boldness, mighty, or means strong or power. And then that word still means to repose, to desist from exertion. So what happened is when we enter into praise, we're going to what? Cause the enemies to desist in our lives. Cause him to cease. Why? Because your focus is not going to be on him, the enemy, and what he's doing to you. But your focus is going to be on him. What's the definition of praise? What? To tell the value and worth of a person who is what? Jesus. So this is how we're going to worship and praise him. And so you don't praise him because you feel like it. You praise him because it's right to do so. Don't go by your feelings. Because you go by your feelings, you'll never praise him. You may say, well, I, you know, I just don't like doing that. It ain't about you liking. It's about what you have to do. If you're going to allow the enemy to desist in operating in your life, you better praise him. You better praise him and give him glory and honor. You better not be ashamed. You better praise him unashamedly. Ain't time to be cute. Worrying about your nails or your hair or the outfits you got on. You enter into that attitude of worship and praise. Glory. Hallelujah. Write down uh, Hebrews 13, 15. And it talks about uh, the sacrifice of praise, and it's the fruit of your lips. And write down 1 Peter 2, 9. And write down 1 Peter 4.11, all that has to do with praise. Now, I'm going to give you uh, a Psalm 18.3. It's talking about how the Lord who is worthy to be praised. And that word praise, here, all these, word, these scriptures that I'm going to give you in Psalm, it's the Hebrew word halal. And I know the, the praise folks ought to know what this is. Halal. It's the Hebrew word for halal. And the word halal means to be clear, to shine, hence to make a show. It means to boast. 
and thus to be clamorously foolish. In other words, when you get into praising God, you don't care about how folks think you have what you're doing. He said clamorously foolish because you, you are going to look foolish to the world or to someone who's subdued and sophisticated and it don't take all that. Yes, it does. You don't know what that person went through. Don't be so uppity because you dirt like all the rest of us. Came from dirt, going back to dirt. So they, I haven't said that tonight, so they helping, they, you know, they saying my little, my little words. I used to say, hello. <laughs> <laughs> they used to be saying that, so they, they miss it that they're going to say it for me. <laughs> and then in Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2, great is our God in the beautiful city. That was a song that we used to sing. And then in Psalm 96, verse 4, it says, the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. And I know you know this in Psalm 113.3, from the rising of the sun to the down of the same, he's worthy to be praised. And we're going to turn to this last scripture, and then we're going to do exactly what we just said we were going to do. Go to Psalm 145. And tonight... We're going to cap this off by worshiping and praising him. And if you have never done this before freely, you're going to do it tonight. Psalm 145, verse 3, it says, Great is the Lord, and what? And greatly to be praised, and his greatness, what? Is unsearchable. So now listen to me. Mr. Doss is going to uh, bring some songs and we're going to enter in. Think about, when we think about the, the, the temple and the, the temple and the tabernacle. So right now we're in the outer court. We're going to start in the outer court into the inner court to the holy, of, to the holy place and then to the Holy of Holies. Forget about the song that we should sing, just forget about yourself and concentrate on him and worship him. So you're going to forget about yourself. Nobody's going to be looking at you because they're going to be what? They're going to be worshiping him too. Start, Mr. Doss, start it off. Now, you know, probably... Come on, make a joyful noise in this house. Make a joyful noise. Come on, make a joyful noise. Salvation is the free gift 
that the Lord offers anyone who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that with our hearts we believe unto righteousness and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation. I trust that you will believe God's word, that your faith will be in the risen Savior who came to give his life for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Will you pray with me this prayer of salvation? It's not difficult. It's very easy, but you must mean it from your heart. So repeat these words after me. Jesus, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. With my mouth, I confess you and I receive you as my Savior. Jesus, thank you for making my heart your home. Thank you for living in me. God the Father is now my Father and the Holy Spirit has done a work in me. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and thank you for guiding my life. In Jesus' name, amen. We're here to be a blessing to you at Spirit Food Christian Center. The way this broadcast is brought to you is by people's faithful sowing and reaping as a result of God's word being given unto them. So I want to encourage you, be a part of this ministry of sowing and reaping. The Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In this ministry, we believe that man must hear the word of God. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Bible declares, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God loves a cheerful and hilarious giver. I encourage you, be a part of this ministry. Be hilarious in your giving and watch the Lord bring it back to you in many, many ways. In Jesus' name. You have been watching the Spirit Food Christian Center worldwide webcast online at www.myspiritfood.com. Join us for worship service each Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And be sure to check out our website for our weekly live broadcast and much, much more. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good.